here with all of you again for Llewellyn Con. It only feels as if it's barely, barely a few weeks since the last one. The year has flown by so quickly. And it's lovely to see all of your comments running up and down on the right hand side of the page. Thank you all for being here. You are very, very welcome here to my little talk on Druidry at Llewellyn Con 2023. So my name is Christopher Hughes. I'm the head of the Anglesey Druid Order here in North Wales in the United Kingdom, a little island that's floating out in the middle of the Irish Sea. So it's quite delightful here today. The sun is shining, delightfully warm. And the island from which I'm speaking to you from was the ancestral seat of the British Druids. And from what we know from the classical authors, the Druids of Gaul, they sought their teachings here in the British Isles. And it seems as if the island of Anglesey was equally important in that teaching tradition. And we know that it was significant as a threat to Rome, because in the year 62 of the Common Era, Suetonius Paulinus marched over 20,000 men at arms from Londinium, current day London, all the way up here to North Wales to destroy those pesky druids on the island of Anglesey and put an end to the socio political and religious sway that the druids had over the Celtic tribes that Rome were trying to suppress. So it comes with a lot of history, this tiny little island, and it's described really viscerally by a classical author called Tacitus, who wrote about the invasion of the island of Anglesey. And you can, you can read those things just by Googling Tacitus Anglesey and uh, read the, the visceral account of what happened here. So Druids in antiquity seemed to have been very important people within their socio-political and religious environments. And Druidry has never really left the British Isles in one way or another. They've long been romanticised, they've long been misunderstood, and they've long been perceived to have been this great priest caste of the Celtic peoples that were this very real threat to the Roman Empire. But who exactly were they? And what is a Druid then? What was a Druid in the imagination? And what is a Druid by today's standards? So when we consider Druidry of the 21st century, it's not going to bear much semblance to the Druidry that was here 2,000 years ago. We were a very different society. We were a very different peoples back then. We were still fairly tribal as um, Celtic folk here in the British Isles. And the Druids seemed to be a unifying force that brought all of those tribes into some form of cohesion, whether or even if that cohesive spirit was only one that was ritualistic or philosophical, spiritual or religious. But we know that they had an important grasp on Celtic culture until, of course, the coming of Rome. But what is a Druid today? How do we define a Druid today? So essentially, the way that I define a Druid in the 21st century is taken from the meaning of the word itself. So the word Druid in the English language comes from two components, which themselves stem from the Indo-European languages of Northern Europe. And it comes from Dru, which is an old, old ancient word for oak, and id meaning to know. So if we look at that word in my own native language, so my first language, I'm speaking to you now in my second language, English. My first language is Cymraeg, ag os fyswn i'n siarad yn Cymraeg, um, efallai, mae'n sychu ddim yn ymnallu. So that's what Welsh kind of sounds like. And I just said, if I spoke in Welsh, no doubt the majority of you would not understand what on earth I was going on about. So in the Welsh language, the word for druid is derwydd. And derwydd, it means almost the same as druid. It's made up of two words, deru, meaning oak, and uiv, which is a mutation of guiv, which is to know or to understand or to seek the knowledge of. So essentially, the word druid means somebody who knows the oak or is oak wise. 
somebody who strives to be as wise as the oak. And if you consider a great big park oak in wherever wherever you live, and I assume, I assume, I might be incorrect, but I assume that the majority of you that are listening to this have some familiarity with what an oak tree might look like and you might have them in your own location. But here in the British Isles, the oaks are these tremendously majestic creatures. They're, they're enormous trees. They harbor sometimes well over 2000 species of different life. Their branches tend to sag. And in some cases, in some of the very, very old oaks, the branches almost come back down to ground and some might hit the ground and rise back up again. They're the most magnificent of trees. And when we look at the structure of the word druid, it seems especially in my musings and visions, to encompass the quality that the oak reflects, this great big tree that is a sentinel and a witness to the passing of time. And of course, trees in general are not strangers to the spiritual landscape. Almost every religious system, almost every spiritual tradition all across the globe have at some somewhere within their hearts, within their core, they will have a tree. They will have a tree that is significant to the practices and beliefs of that tradition, whether it's the Kabbalistic tree of life, whether it's the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, whether it's Akhtarasil in the Northern tradition. There are trees in Eastern traditions, they're all over the place. And they're really at the heart of the Druid tradition. And we know that because it's carried forward in the meaning of the name that we give ourselves. So today, a druid is somebody who strives to be oak wise, is somebody who strives to gather and express the knowledge that the oak symbolizes. And it's somebody that does it through a Celtic cultural continuum or a Celtic worldview. Because we know that the druids of antiquity, of antiquity were people within the Celtic cultural continuum. Now, the word Celtic can be somewhat problematic because we assume that the word Celtic is a blanket term that covers a multitude of peoples and a multitude of sins. But it's really not that simple because the, the Celtic culture that exists today is defined by six nations that have their own identity. They have their own languages. They have their own um, expression of culture. But we're all held, if you like, or we're all embraced underneath the umbrella of the Celtic cultural continuum, which can be defined by artistic expression and by the use of certain lines of language. So today, the Celts are defined as those who are P-Celts or Brythonic, which would be Brittany in northwestern France, Cornwall in southwestern England, and Wales here to the West. So we speak a language that is very similar. So if I stop and listen to somebody from Brittany or somebody from Cornwall, and likewise, if they were to stop and listen to myself and my fellow country folk, very quickly we would start to understand each other's sentence structures. And the syntax is, is, is very similar because we share this P-Celtic line of language. So the Q-Celts or the Goidelics are those who live in Ireland, the Isle of Man, and up in Ur Alban. Ur Alban in English is Scotland. And they all speak a form of Gaelic or Gaelic. Now, whilst we all share a commonality within the Celtic cultural continuum, those language streams are very, very different. So whilst I can understand somebody who is living in Brittany, I can't understand somebody who speaks Irish, even though Ireland is only 54 miles away from my home, just across the Irish Sea. And I can't understand a person who speaks Scottish. But there are similar structures within the language if you were to sit down and study it and break it down. So the Celts in antiquity were also people who were spread out over a very large area and they had diverse beliefs. They had diverse language expressions and they had diverse spiritual practices, but seemingly overlooking those practices were these people called Druids. So the Celtic cultural continuum still exists today. And a peculiar thing that I find as a modern day Celt 
is that when people talk about the Celts, they seem to have a tendency, an, an unconscious bias, if you like, to refer to the Celts in the past tense, as if they are something that happened in the past. But we're actually still here. We, we, we didn't go anywhere. The Celts still exist today. I am a Celt by definition, that I speak a Celtic language or a language that comes and is derived from the Celtic cultural continuum, which is Cymraic or Welsh. And so do my Irish cousins, my Manx, my Scottish cousins, and my siblings in Cornwall and Brittany. There is some arguments to say that there is also a Celto-Iberian stream, which would imply that there's a Celt part of the Celtic cultural continuum is to be found in regions of Spain, which is fascinating. But generally today, the six Celtic nations are referred to as Wales, Cornwall, Brittany, Ireland, the Isle of Man, and Scotland. And what they all have in common is that they have a tendency to connect to the echoes of Druids in the past. But here in Wales, it's uh, slightly different in that Druidry here is almost endemic. It's endemic within our culture. So Welsh culture itself expresses its wisdom and its creativity, its sagacity, its love of art and language and song and dance and all of that gorgeous creative stuff, it does so through the lens of Druidry, through the lens of Druids. So we have a huge celebration here in Wales every August, and there are regional celebrations that happen all year round. But the main one in August is called the National Eisteddfod of Wales, and it's presided over by a board of Druids. And those Druids have a name. They used to be called uh, the Gorsev of Bards of the island of Britain. But nowadays, they've, they've slowly started to change that name to Gorsev Cymru, or the, um, the Welsh uh, Gorsev. Gorsev basically means a high seat or uh, a place in which one might sit and perceive or see a wonder. And these Druids, they present themselves in either blue gowns, green gowns, or white gowns. And it's quite a spectacle. It's quite a spectacle to watch. And you can watch that uh, on the Welsh National Television Network, which is called this. I just happen to be wearing their T-shirt, S4C, Chanel Pedwar Camry, or the, the, um, the fourth channel of Wales. And uh, so I work for that particular company as a presenter and an actor. And you can watch the rituals and ceremonies of the National Eisteddfod by just subscribing to S4C um, free, and you can watch it anywhere in the world. Just Google that word and you will find a little link. And I'm extremely thrilled that this year I'm to be admitted into that Druid institution as well. So on Friday, the 11th of August at 10.30 a.m., I'm to be inducted into Gorsev Camry, into the Blue Gowns for uh, my services to language and heritage through the Anglesey Druid Order um, by writing books like this one here, which is available directly from Llewellyn worldwide right now, uh, my book of Druidry. So I've gone off on a slight tangent, haven't I? What was I talking about? Oh, yes. So essentially... Druids are those who express the qualities of the oak, the sagacity and wisdom of the oak. It is essentially a wisdom tradition. But what is a wisdom tradition and what is the point of a wisdom tradition? So one of the questions that I like the most, because I find this particular question really challenging when it comes not necessarily to what one might identify spiritually, but to anything that one does in pursuit of one's passions and interests. I like the question of what's the point? What is the point of a druid? What does a druid do? What's the point of it? And I really like that question because when somebody, somebody asked me that question about 20 years ago and I didn't really have an answer I thought, oh, oh, and I felt really stumped. And I thought, oh, hold on a second. I need to go, I need to really sit down and think about this. What is the point of a Druid? And the conclusion that I've come to is that a Druid isn't just somebody who is inspired by the Celtic cultural continuum, which gave rise to the earlier Druids. That's not to suggest that one has to be a Celt in order to be a Druid. It has gone beyond the limitations or the restrictions of the culture that held it for, for such a long time. Just like the steam that would rise from Keridwen's cauldron of Awen, Keridwen's brew of inspiration, Druidry has now found voices and people all over the world and I think, you know, the people that I meet along the way, along the dappled forest path of Druidry, most of the people that I speak to, they have some kind of connection either through their ancestry 
or through their spiritual constitution to the lands of Wales and Ireland and Scotland or to regions of northern France, that they feel some kind of connection to that. And I would say that that is either their cultural constitution that is calling to them through their ancestry, or it's their spiritual constitution that's calling to them. That the people within those cultures in the past would have been your spiritual ancestors. So you don't have to be a Celt in order to be a Druid, but that's not to negate where Druidry came from. It came from the cauldron of the Celts. It was defined by those people. And then it was a gift of sagacity and wisdom that has now been given to the world because gods only know we need wisdom in our world. And essentially the point of a Druid is to be a bridge between not only the other world and the apparent world to bring the wisdom of the subtle realms, if you like, into the apparent world, but to be a bridge from disenchantment to a place of enchantment. So magic is very much a part, a very vibrant, lively and vital part of the Druidry that I practice and the Druidry that is practiced in the Anglesey Druid Order, which I head. Magic is very much a vital part of what we do. We're magical people who serve to enchant the world and strive to seed the future with wisdom. And we need the future to be seeded with wisdom. When we look and we see what is happening in the world, the problems that the world is facing, what we see is a lack of wisdom. We see people, I don't believe that, you know, that the world is populated by bad people, but I do believe that good people can end up making bad decisions and that those bad decisions can define them. But if we can bring wisdom into the decisions that we make, perhaps we can all serve to enchant the world. And that that really is the point of a druid. The point of a druid is to see the world through an animistic, polytheistic lens, which is inspired by the cauldron of the Celts. It's inspired by language. It's inspired by mythology and folklore and legend. It's inspired by the very beauty of the world around us and our place as an extension of the very same force that gave rise to stars and galaxies and planets, we are an extension of that same force. And within that, there is sagacity and wisdom. So a druid, there's a, there's a, there's a lovely term, a slight tangent, from the second branch of the Mabinogi. So the Mabinogi or the Mabinogion collection is a collection of 11 native um, tales from Wales. And four of them are called the four branches of the Mabinogi. And in the second one, there's a giant who is a king of the island of the mighty, the British Isles. And his name is Bendy Geidvran or Bran the Blessed. And he uses a term in the mythology, which is Avo Pen Bead Bont. And Avo Pen Bead Bont means, let him who be a leader be a bridge. And that term is used in Welsh culture a lot, but it's also used as an aspirational uh, quotation, as an aspir as 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 something that is aspirational within Druidry itself, that we act as bridges to lead people into a place of enchantment. So to me, Druidry is something that is very magical. It connects me not only to my culture, um, through my language, through my mythology, through the folklore of my country but it enables me to be able to share that wisdom with the rest of the world. And all of these beautiful myths and folklore that we share on our planet, they, they're they also similar. I spend an awful lot of time up in Finland. I go to Finland every winter because we don't really have winters here in Britain. And it struck me, it struck me as wondrous that so many of the mythologies up in that part of the world, which is very, very far from here, are very similar to the myths that are a heart, at the very heart of the Druid tradition. So I, I firmly believe that the planet itself gives rise to those mythologies and offers them to us, offers them to us as pearls of wisdom, pearls of sagacity that we can glean from, become enchanted and share that enchantment with the world. 
So when it comes to Druids themselves, their history is very long. It's very, very complicated because it's colored by all of the different cultures that had an expression of Druidry, but not just Celtic cultures either, because the popularity of Druidry in the 21st century comes very much from English culture, and then of course from American culture. So it's something that has found its way into so many different cultural expressions, but it holds at its very heart, at its core, it holds this sagacity that is expressed from the very core of the tree of life. And that the message within Druidry is that Druidry attempts to pull us back to find our center, where everything is unified. And when we find the center of ourselves, which is which has always been within us, it's never been anywhere out there. And even Doreen Valiente, the famous witch of the 20th, 20th century, she wrote in her Charge of the Goddess that if that which thou seekest, thou findest not within you, thou shalt never find it without you. And that message is very true in Druidry, that the search for the tree, the search for the world tree, for the sagacity of the oak is contained within you. That acorn resides somewhere here in your chest and it's waiting for you to germinate the sagacity that is within you and Druidry offers us an opportunity to be able to not only share that wisdom with the world but also to share our presence our foot tread on the planet with other non-human beings and learn from them with the other persons that inhabit our world so we do an awful lot within forests and groves and you know if you want if you want to find a druid find a woodland and you're probably going to find one in there somewhere you know so every sixth night of the new moon um we gather as druids in a grove that is very local to my home and when we gather there we're not just gathering as human beings we're gathering with our friends who live in the forest we gather with the other persons that reside there with the tree persons and the shrub persons and the flower persons the rock and the stone persons the river persons the star of the sky and the owl persons all of them are personages personages is that even a word you'll forgive me because english is my second language right so we gather there to be in communion and to be in community with the animistic principle that we're a part of and that is very much an aspect of being a druid and expressing what druidry is. And of course, just the fact that we call it druidry means that it's something that we do. It isn't something that we think about. If we were only to think about it, it would be druidism. But it isn't an ism. It's a, a re. It's a druidry. We, we do it. We actively do it. And the way in which we do it is by sharing our inspiration sharing our inspiration by a force that we call awen. Awen means blessed holy breath in the Welsh language and it's a force that blows through the entire universe right all through the entire universe and it brings everything into being and the way that we express that is through our creativity whether it's song, poetry, dance, acting, writing, uh, anything, anything that expresses your creativity expresses that fundamental creative force that is inherent within everything and it's inside of you. So when you express that you're doing your druidry, when you're enchanting the people around you and inspiring the world, you're doing a druidry and doing it by striving and trying as hard as you can to be that which is wise in the world really captures the spirit of what Druidry represents over the last 2,500 years of its existence. And of course, it's gone through huge changes and it isn't the same Druidry as it was 2,500 years ago. And it's probably not the same Druidry as it was 300 years ago here in Wales. And But that doesn't matter. What matters is, is that the awen within it causes it to be propelled into the future and for it to survive, of course it has to adapt and evolve, but at the very heart of it, we are those people who seek the wisdom of the oak and then seek to disseminate and share that with the world. I personally call that a DTI or a druid transmitted infection and a druid transmitted infection is inspiration or Awen. You can see I'm wearing a symbol of the Awen around my neck, the three rays of Awen. So a Druid is, Druidry is something that we do. 
It's something that we do in line and it is inspired by the Celtic cultural continuum. It's something that you can do anywhere in the world by seeking the wisdom and the teachings of trees. The trees have so much that they can teach us. And we might think that, oh, we're not trees. We don't speak the same language. We all share a common tongue because all of us are uh, expressions of the universe itself. And the common language that we all have is what we call our, that blessed holy breath. So when we want to connect to the natural world, we sing to it. We sing to it by either chanting the word awen or chanting the sacred vowels that are associated with each of these three rays. Or we might chant the verb for awen, which in the Welsh language is awena. You just stick an A on the end of it and it becomes a verb. It becomes, becomes something that you do. So that's what we do. We inspire the world and we do it through a lens that was old when the world was new. And yet we keep making it new. We keep renewing it. We keep remembering bits from the past and we make them appropriate and applicable to the present. So if somebody asks you, what is a druid? A druid is somebody who carries the wisdom of the oak, who strives to be oak wise, and they're inspired by the Celtic cultural continuum. What is the point of a druid? point of the druid is to seed the wisdom, seed the future with wisdom. And if you can consider all of those seeds, the little acorn that you have inside of you that has the potential to become a great oak, and the oak, the acorns that other people around you have within them that have the potential to become an oak, we become these groves of sagacity and wisdom, of magic and delight. And it's a delightful tradition that I love being a part of because it brings to my life the most utmost joy, delight and wonder. And it helps to transform all of my anxieties into joy. And it can be, it can do the same for you. And you can find information about it by reading one of my books, The Book of Druidry, available now from Sir Ellen Worldwide. So, so come, so come and meet us, the druids, in the dappled light of the sacred grove. And come and make magic that made the world. Because that's what we do. That's what we do. So if you want to find out more about um, Druidry, you can just Google Druidry and you'll come up with a load of answers. Or you can go to angleseedruidorder.co.uk, which is the order that I had. And we offer online rituals and courses and an online course as well in Druidry. And, um, or you can visit my page at Llewellyn Worldwide. And I'm sure Llewellyn will pop those links up there. And if anybody has a question, you can ask me a question, but I'm not entirely sure how that's going to happen. <laughs> not entirely sure. 30 minutes have gone by in an absolute flash. That is, um, that is crazy, but thank you so much. So I'm just looking through the comments. Um, I'm not sure if um, Llewellyn will wing me any questions or can you elaborate on that turning anxieties into joy? Yeah, Jamie, I think, um, so when we look at, um, at, oh gosh, how much time have I got? Okay, so within Celtic mythology, and I, I do elaborate on it in my book as well, is that um, it describes that as we as we grow up, we fall into states of anxiety where, you know, we eventually try and go looking for ourselves, and yet the answers were always within us. And I think to answer your question in a very, very quick nutshell without having to elaborate over 15 pages in a book, is that ultimately... We're not able to cure the world of its sorrows. We can never, ever do that. We can help to inspire and enchant the world, but we can never cure it of its sorrows. But we can all choose to live joyously. And whilst that may sound flippant or it may sound banal to an extent, it isn't because within joy there is profound wisdom. And it requires wisdom in order for us to find the joy in our lives. Even when things are really tough and when we've lost people or we've lost our jobs or our stability, there is still elements within life in which we can find joy. And when we find those moments of joy, that's when we find ourselves. That's when we find the sagacity within us to be able to transcend our anxieties. And we might only be able to do that for a very short period of time before reality comes and bites us. But the more we strive towards joy, 
the more wisdom we find within ourselves and hopefully the more wisdom and joy that we inject into the world. So it's a working process. I'm constantly working on turning my anxieties into joy, which is a part and parcel of the Druid journey. It's not something that, you know, I will never be that I'm not even sure if there is such a thing as a perfect Druid. I'm certainly not going to be the perfect Druid. Um, I love um, chocolate and watching RuPaul's Drag Race and Star Trek on television far too much, you know, to be a bookworm constantly. Um, but I do believe firmly that my druidry is that constant journey towards the transformation of my anxieties into joy. And I cover a lot of that in the in the book that I've I've written. So hopefully that's so much of a nutshell of um, trying to answer your question. So today my moment of joy was having the opportunity to hear you speak. Oh, that's so nice, Alicia Hadley. Thank you so much. That is so sweet. That has made me really smile. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, um, is there another question there? Um, somebody asks, what is the meaning of the symbol that I'm wearing around my neck? So uh, the the name of this in the Welsh language is a Nord covering, which means the mystic mark. And it is essentially the song of the universe itself. And in a nutshell, again, because I'm running out of time, um, in the very beginning when there was no thing at all, suddenly there was something. And the second there was something, there were three things. There was the nothing that became aware of itself and the relationship between it. And from that point of origin, three blinding rays of light shot out across the universe. And as that ray of light, rays of light shot out, everything burst into into being, into creation. So essentially it represents the creative force of the universe through three rays of light. And you might have heard the term, the three rays or the three rays of Awen in general neo-pagan um, talk or books. So it's, uh, in a nutshell, that's what it describes. But I do elaborate on that in my book of Druidry. So um, I love how open this is for all beings. All magic should be this way. Exactly. You know, we don't own Druidry. And whilst um, I am Welsh, I'm very, very proud of being a Welsh person. I, um, It's my language. It's, it connects me to my land. But Druidry isn't something that we own. Nobody can ever own wisdom, right? Nobody owns it. We have been guardians of that tradition and we've enabled that tradition to, to move on through time and to change and be coloured by all of the other people that have met us throughout the millennia. So we don't own it. We were just those people who had it as part of our cultural expression. And now it's time to share it with the world because the message in there, the message that comes from that little acorn that is sitting in all of your chests right now has the potential to be a great oak tree. That message is something that can't be limited to just six nations. You know, we can't be selfish. We can't hold on to it. We have to share it with the world. And um, that's precisely what um, I love to do. And um, and hopefully that's what I'm doing, spreading a DTI, a druid transmitted infection. So thank you all so much. You have been very, very welcome um, on my little talk here at Llewellyn Con. And uh, oh, someone says, I did send you a message on Facebook with an invite to be my guest on Pagan Artist Spotlight. I look forward to talking to you. Oh, lovely. I shall go and look for that message. And um, Jamie says, what a treat this has been. Jamie, it has been an absolute treat for me as well. I love, love being a part of the Llewellyn Worldwide family. Um, they bring to my life an awful lot of joy and wonder. And Llewellyn is saying, this has been a lovely, this has been lovely. Christopher, thank you, which is thank you to say goodbye. So I wish you good evening, Nosweitha, or good afternoon, Prinhounda, or good morning, Borida, wherever you are in the world. And hopefully I shall see you somewhere along the line on this amazing journey that we're all having as we catapult around our gorgeous star, having all of these amazing experiences together. So if you fancy doing something tomorrow, why don't you be a druid? And if you want to know how to do that, you can go here and it will tell you. <laughs> I'll see you all soon.